Welcome to the BAMP World Media Festival. Your session is about to begin. A runcher. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, my name is Deborah Drisdell, and I'm here with my colleague, Louisa Frate, today. And um, I thought we would talk a little bit uh, to you a little bit about digital distribution, share a few insights about what we've learned along the last couple of years that we've been working on this, and, uh, and also finish off talking to you about a couple of new things we're working on that we're really pretty excited about. Because um, it really is an exciting time to be at the NFB. Uh, four years ago, though, many in our industry thought that uh, digital technology would really be a threat to our community. We saw it as an opportunity to directly connect to our audience, something that we had lost over the years a bit. And it was really a golden opportunity for us to be able to connect to our audience. And that connection is really vital to who the NFB is. And frankly, I think it's really vital to who we are as Canadians that we be able to have those direct connections. Um, so uh, we set a few ground rules when we started. We're going to go through a bit of the presentation. A few ground rules when we started to prepare NFB.ca. Uh, it was anchored in our core values, really. Um, it had to be a rich viewing experience, and we said this over and over and over again. Uh, we weren't building a website. That was never our intention. And uh, we wanted really wide accessibility and community engagement. So the wide accessibility meant certain tough decisions we made. One of them was we wouldn't geo-block this, that NFB.ca would be available uh, everywhere in the world and that we would clear as many rights as we could to make that possible. Uh, we wanted to showcase Canadian diversity and its cultural diversity across the generations, across the regions, and complètement bilingue. And it had to be fiercely, fiercely user-centric. That was a real challenge, I can tell you, with the techies in the group, because sometimes the wow factor made it a little harder to use, a little harder to find. And so that was a real battle, but we were really fierce in making sure that it was user-centric. And then we made a few other decisions, really, along the way. We built an API, so really an infrastructure, as we did it, that would allow us to grow incrementally. We knew we had to do this in steps, and we also knew that we couldn't wait until it was perfect to release it. And I think that was a really good insight that we ended up paying off, was we, if we waited till it was perfect, the, the train would have left the station. So we, we really built it in incremental pieces. And in order to do that, we needed a really uh, important infrastructure base. And my colleague, Luisa Frate, who's here, is going to talk to you a lot about the infrastructure in a few minutes. Um, another decision we had was uh, destination and syndication. Uh, you can't build something and expect people to find you. So we really had a, a mixture of building NFB sites and building sites uh, partnering with YouTube Vimeo um, to also have our content on those platforms. 
And uh, you may have seen yesterday, we announced actually the first Canadian online channel in China, a partnership with Phoenix Media. It was just announced yesterday. So over 100 NFB films will be on a dedicated NFB channel in mainland China. It's a first for Canada, and we're really proud about that. Thank you. And uh, core to the NFB values is that we were going to protect our brand uh, fiercely. So in every um, viewing experience, it was really important that people knew they were watching an NFB film, always, that that brand was really, really important. We also felt, beyond our belief of that, that uh, brand was going to be curation in the digital space, and that having that clear brand presence was going to be really critical as we moved forward in the digital space, so that people knew what they were watching and knew what to look for. And we would honor our traditional, um, <clears throat> slightly older audiences, which includes me, but we really were hoping to connect with new audiences and younger audiences, and we really, that was a fierce also. So in January of 2009, I won't go through all our history, we launched NFB.ca, and we followed really quickly in the fall with our iPhone application. The success was immediate to this application. Uh, in the first, the, you know, you have to think in 2009 to now video uh, online and on mobile is fairly commonplace, but at that point it really wasn't. And um, so we quickly got to the top of the entertainment category in iTunes, and the ones following actually were, um, well, very far from the NFB's core. They were a little bit porn and uh, things, so we spent a few weeks walking around the NFB saying we were better than sex. So we were very happy about that, and um, we actually won the Entertainment App of the Year by iTunes Canada that year. Um, and uh, interestingly, that was the app that really helped us connect with the young audiences. It went off, and my, teenager da my teenage daughter, rolling her eyes, actually had to finally admit that her mom working for the NFB was cool. So that was a real challenge uh, for us. Um, following that success, um, we went quickly, developed also Android iPad partners uh, quickly, and in 2001, both upgraded our iPad app and launched our very first pre-installed app on RIM's playbook. And we're continuing with strong growth as we see that the consumers are migrating clearly to the tablets, and the media consumption is moving away from that. We've really moved forward to pushing into the mobile. And uh, this year, we're launching on the new kid on the block, Connected TV. You may have heard we've already um, announced a partnership with LG. We have one with Samsung, and uh, we'll be pre-installed with Google as they enter Canada in the fall. So we really think that this is going to be also a really strong growth area in uh, connected television. While it's still in the early days, that uptake of connected television is swift, and manufacturers um, predict that 80% of that offer in 2015 will be connected. We're still showing that research shows people want to watch their films in their living rooms still, and that that's going to be a predominant uh, place. So we'll be there with our apps to show it. So as you can see, it really was, I hate using the term ecosystem, but it really was about building that incremental growth of the ecosystem to be able to work through. And it wasn't about building that web website. It was also fundamentally about changing the way we do business. And I know the traditional business is still there, but we felt we really had to completely rethink the way our business model is. And later on, I'll come back to talk a bit about that. But also, being able to deploy this, and we're a small organization, as you all know, it's not easy. It's hard to do it quickly. And so my colleague, Louisa, is now going to talk to you about what I call the magic behind the play button. So Louisa. My intention is just to give you a little bit of a glimpse of what we've done in the background. Uh, some say it's uh, maybe not that sexy, but it's extremely important. So in order to support all these business models and initiatives and to address users' needs and expectations, we really had to move ideas at the speed of light. The first thing we did is looked at industry challenges. What are the challenges that we were facing? And basically, we realized that there were two main challenges. Challenges in terms of production, which you can see on one side of the screen, and challenges in terms of distribution, which you can see on the other side of the screen. The first thing is production formats. Now, all of you as producers know that there are so many different for, uh, production formats that are coming down the pipeline, and we have to deal with this reality. We have HD that's giving way to 2K, giving way to 4K. Just an example, this summer in the Olympics in, in London, we will see 4K large screens placed in many public spaces. So we realize that this is really a reality of today. 
We have other production formats, 3D, web interactive, and we have to change all our production and post-production environment to deal with this. Just an example for us, when we talk about web interactive projects, we have to make sure that we receive a multitude of different little films or on different little formats, and that we amalgamate them to produce it on one platform. So it is really a challenge that we have to deal with on a regular basis. In terms of file-based production, we know we're all headed from a, to a completely tapeless environment. Uh, we have to track all our digital files throughout our production and post-production environment. We have to be able to ingest all the content. We have to coordinate and transfer files within our post-production environment. We have to promote remote collaboration with our partners. Geographical boundaries no longer exist. And we have to favor exchange of information. And this, for us, was something new. Metadata did not exist in our systems. We had to make sure that we were able to create and to retain and retrieve. So basically, digital era brought enormous quantity of data, dramatic impact on infrastructure, network, storage, and archive. On the other side, I'll just go back, Deborah, sorry. On the other side, Distribution platforms, well, you know that there's been an explosion. We've all been dealing with it. Mobile, VOD, DVD, D-Cinema, E-Cinema. We partner with many organizations, such as In Demand, uh, iTunes, and each one of them have their own recipe. They have their own recipe in terms of the content and in terms of metadata. So we have to make sure that we're able to provide all the content to all these participants on-demand, just-in-time kind of delivery. The other element that was really difficult for us and important was our physical collection. We have over 13,000 titles that are in our vaults in terms of film, tape. Each one of these titles has a multitude of eight, nine, 10 different versions in terms of length and language. So how do you bring that physical collection to a completely virtual collection file-based digital elements so that we can then bring them and put them online. So there was a real critical need to develop a technological plan. This plan included better and dedicated media infrastructure, faster access to data, content archiving, systems integration, media information management, automization of processes, and I'll talk about that, and robust digitization plan. So basically, our technological plan had two elements. They had a technical element and a non-technical element, and we had to marriage the two. Technical, I talked about it, a dedicated media infrastructure, servers, integration of storage, bandwidth, production tools, and all this has to be scalable and flexible. Now at the end of B, we have been working on a digital environment for many years. However, our, techno our technologies, our equipment, and our business needs did not flow through to our systems. So that was a huge challenge for us. We had to bridge between systems. We had to make sure we had operational flexibility, improve performance and efficiencies. On a non-technical side, because all our systems changed, well, all our work methods had to change. We had to basically work with our team to show them and train them on new work methods. We automized many of our processes. So all the work that were repetitive work and clerical work were automized. And we had our team trained and focused more on the creative side of it. Metadata, we structured metadata the same way in all of our systems so that we can ingest and also retrieve information. And in terms, this was one of the critical things, in terms of our own system, our own legacy system, what existed in the back end, well, it was so focused on what we had in terms of physical, DVD, film, uh, tape, so on. How did we shift that to a virtual environment, which is tapeless, um, and going from a concept of versions to a concept of components where you can basically choose whatever combination you want in whatever flavor you want. So in the end, for me, technology is absolutely fascinating, but it must deliver results. Information is key to this new environment. 
data is necessary in order for us to manipulate content, but nada is necessary to measure the organization's performance and success. If we don't have information that we can pull from our systems, we don't really know how well we're doing. So that was key to us. So it's structured bibliographic as well as technical metadata. Oh, no, sorry. And this metadata was integrated with our client's delivery and enhanced user experience for indexation in their content and in their own library. So what we could do, for example, is you can go on nfb.ca, download one of our titles, and integrate it in our iTunes, uh, your own iTunes library, and sort it with the metadata in whichever way you want. You want to sort it by documentaries, by animation, short, long, uh, the title, it's up to you. You have all the information readily available at your fingertips. The, all, the other thing that we also did was we created executive level dashboards to measure our performance. And this we use on a daily basis internally. Our digitization plan, this is another thing that we put into place all at pretty much at the same time, two years ago, this one. Uh, we needed a robust digitization plan because of our collection that was on film and, and tape. So what we did is, because we are small, because we don't have a lot of resources, we did a three objectives. This plan had to ensure that we had future access to our collection on a digital format from future generations. We preserve our work on a digital format, and we restored any title that was deteriorated over time, as you know, film deteriorates. And from these objectives, we did a three-step digitization plan. We basically did a high-resolution uh, digital copy of our film. This is a mirror. So if there's snow, scratches, uh, color degradation, that's what's going to appear on this digital source master. You then treat it for color, sound, synchronization, et cetera, and you can slightly compress it to present a mezzanine file. And it is this mezzanine file that we then encode to deliver whatever is requested from our distribution partners. The fun thing about this mezzanine file is that it gives us all the flexibility we need in terms of managing all possible versions of our work. So we did not digitize each version of our title the way we had it in the past, what we did is we digitized each component separately. So we digitized the body only one time, the titles, English and French, separately, the sounds, English and French, separately, credits as well, subtitles, you get the idea. So there's, you can imagine a, a, um, a package with all these kinds of components in there, not a version, but just different elements, digital elements in there. So when our distribution partner comes up to us and says, well, we have a client, and this client would like this title, but they would like the short English version with video description and closed captioning, all we do is go into that production's package and pull out all of these elements to produce the deliverable that our distribution team requests. And for example, if they have another partner that they would like the exact same title, but this time the long French version with closed captioning, all we do is pull out those elements and that's how we can deliver in a rapid and just in time uh, kind of, of way. So the questions that we asked ourselves and that we addressed was, how do we manage this huge collection with a still, with a huge aging collection, with a still growing collection? You want a just in time on demand with a never ending list of deliverables, combinations and flavors? Well, apart from the digitization plan, we prepared an assembly line. We created our own media factory, whereby it is an application in order to assemble and deliver our media from our own mezzanine file on demand just in time. So the, the media factory, what it does is once those elements, one of those compositions, those components are selected, it automatically assembles it, it then takes that file and it resizes it, encodes it for whatever deliverable you want. So it's four multi-screen deliverables. And it also fetches the metadata so that we can add the metadata to uh, this deliverable because indexing is so important. So all these changes brought increased productivity, improved information, increased operational flexibility, and scalability. So all this infrastructure is great. For me, it's 
fascinating. It's my life. But what we need is to build audience. And I think that's key here. And I'll pass it over to Deborah. Thank you. Uh, indeed, I thought we'd share a little bit of insight as we move forward on this. Um, Although we all know that um, the capability of a viral video of a kitten just astounds us all, really trying to develop something for niche markets like we have takes really a sustained, integrated approach, and it's a long-term building, and it has to be multifaceted. There is some luck involved, too, though luck helps, even if you're not a kitten. So uh, we looked at different areas of the different components. One of them is curation. Um, we know audiences only want to go to a destination that has a rich, deep collection. And the NFB is fortunate that we have that online. Um, but I don't know about you, but saying, come watch 2,500 films would freak me out and intimidate me a bit. So you do need to be able to have some sense of a curation that's going to bring people forward to do that. So we do monitor our traffic very judiciously. We look for it all the time to see what type of offer can be there. And we identify specific productions that might be of interest to our audience for various reasons, either by what we're seeing from their usage or also linked to current events or something that might be happening in their environment that might bring a film forward that we can curate. Um, the other big challenge for all these types of uh, venues is findability. Um, you can't really build and expect things to come. And it's not moving. There we go, findability. Uh, search engines are becoming much more precise in identifying relevant content for us. Uh, but it's only true if your content page itself is carefully optimized and for search. And so we also there develop, we brought teams together. And that's, I think, one of the big changes at the film board is that really all the teams work together in a lot of these pursuits. So it's a very integrated approach between our communications division, marketing, and the social network groups, the social media strategists, to work really together to make sure that we can optimize and we all work the same way so that the search can move forward to do that. Uh, this approach is both cost effective, but has also proved really successful for a number of our niche projects that maybe wouldn't have seen that. Um, but despite that, what I've said, there's hidden jewels and that they still have a hard time being discovered. And so we have to look at trying to find multipliers also to move forward and find things that are discovered. Um, we work there also on two fronts, so very project-specific and subject-specific view where we'll look for multipliers that might be interested in, an, in a specific um, subject matter and also on multipliers that work much more on a genre basis. So we're interested in the NFB, interested in docs in general, animation in general. So you really have to go to both the micro and the more larger uh, elements for those elements. And continue those searches as we move forward. Uh, and then it's important to manage that interest. You want them to come back. You want them to see a lot of different projects. And attention span for viewers can be really, really short. So we really suggest where their next move should be so that hopefully their next move won't be leaving our site. So our teams work on creating discovery paths, we call them. So from one entry point, where to go to the other. And we're working on this to actually improve it dramatically in the next few months um, in an effort to really enhance the experience and entice return viewers and see them. And we have a carousel on the top, the above the fold. And we refresh that weekly, uh, bi-weekly, actually, depending on what, what projects are moving and what could be that interest. And uh, then finally, uh, user and buyer information, that helps us actually look at the users. And it's a precious commodity. And anyone who's doing digital uh, constantly, they talk about that data being the new oil. And Louisa has talked about that. It's very important to know who your user is and to have that direct connection with them. So last year, we introduced a user hub to allow for registered users to be able to identify areas of interest to them and, that, and sign up to hear more about it or when there's new and upcoming programming happening. And then eventually, as that relationship starts building, we're slowly um, converting and enticing them, interesting them in some co paid content, which has allowed us in the last year to open up some newer programming that might have to be uh, at one time during, behind a paywall. So always within the spectrum of their interests, but now giving them different options. So they, there's a, a rich viewing experience that's free, but there may be some elements that we could encourage them to look at. And uh, I thought we'd give you just a little bit of the numbers. In the last 12 months, the sum of our digital activities has resulted in about 7 million views 
what we call a view is actually a proactive decision to view a film. So there's a click, there's no passive uh, views on that. It's the view of the films. Since we started in our initiative, um, it has been over 32 million views uh, since we launched NFB.ca. So it's a, a large audience that for our niche programming we had not seen. Our mobile platform accounted last year for 40% of those views. So really the migration to the tablets is swift, it's faster than most people are seeing, and it's very quick. That was 21% um, year over year, and the mobile 40%, 451% increase in the tablets alone. And our connected television app was just released, the one on LG, Samsung and Google are still yet to be released. We've already seen over 100,000 views on that product that just as it's come to market. And one of the things I thought might be interesting to tell you is the viewing habits that are just starting to shift a little bit. So the primary content of the five to 15 minutes, uh, the preferred time that we often talk about on the web, it's only about 30% of the um, market on the webs. On tablets, it's much higher. Uh, for some reason, it's about 53% um, on tablets are looking at the shorter version of content. And uh, what we're seeing, again, very preliminary from our connected television, however, that the long form is really quite dominant there. So people in the connected television are looking to see the much longer content uh, showing. But again, it's very preliminary. We only have a few hundred thousand views to see that. Uh, so we wanted to start talking about how to explore new revenue streams. We all want to know what the business models are and how we can do that. And so we, we're really looking at a whole bunch of different host of different opportunities to do that. A uh, couple of things that we've learned just through the past few years of this is that not all our content is of interest to distributors, but our audience actually wants to see all of our content. And that was really important difference that we've noticed. We have to have a place where a lot of this niche programming is there because our audience wants to see a lot of different programming in the subject that matters to them. And we also learned that we work best without gatekeepers and that having that direct connection to our audience is really, really important. And so that helps us allow to get some evolving in the evolving marketplace, keeping that core relationship. So we've just recently released our digital boutique offer, which now offers a wide selection in digital formats. We'll eventually replace our DVD, our physical DVD store. We're just starting to launch a video on demand service, which will allow us to do some, so a little bit of experiment in some of the projects of going maybe with a direct to digital launch. So we're anxious to try that with a project and see how that works. And uh, offer just a whole bunch of opportunities, both for VOD, subscription model, and uh, elements with the theatrical. This service layer enables us to sustain current and traditional revenue models while exploring really more aggress aggressive release windows, price points, and customer satisfaction and strategies. These are very young products, so we're projects we're going to keep learning how to integrate them, how they work with our traditional business. We're all faced with a declining traditional business, and you know, the digital business hasn't quite brought up to replace those amounts. And we're working with our partners to see how we can fully exploit all these changes. And now, uh, with the transactional and all the infrastructure, as Louisa was explaining, we're at a place now where we can scale this infrastructure that we've built and include partners into the fold and an online solution. It's a little too early to talk about that yet, but I think there's a real significant potential there, and we're really excited about it. Uh, Campus is uh, one of our projects. I thought I'd show you just a couple of different projects that we've started. When we launched NFB.ca, we created, uh, it was only for consumers, but quickly the schools and teachers said, this is fabulous, I need this in my classroom. So we licensed it for public performance rights in a number of ministries across Canada to do so, and we started talking to teachers and saying, well, if you want it, what would you want? What would be best to do? And uh, so this year, we launched Campus, which is a subscription-based model. It hosts exclusive content and tailored functionalities. It's really designed by teachers and by a communication we had with the teachers. It has a curriculum-based search engine, so you can see if you're teaching history in grade eight in Alberta, uh, we'll suggest some films that work for that. So specific functionality, descriptions for the education market that were written by teachers. We got them through the summer when they weren't so busy to watch our films and give us a core curriculum on it. Uh, a search engine, the playlist creation. So teachers can create a playlist and save the playlist. And the most popular tool they've had, which is a chaptering tool. So most teachers say they can't show a whole film in the classroom. So they can take the segments 
and put them in their playlist and prepare their whole classroom experience for the next day. This is a subscription-based model uh, for teachers, by teachers, and uh, with exclusive tools. Then on the consumer market, I'm going to talk to you a bit about apps. Finally, that, that market's moving really, really swiftly, and you have to keep moving forward to test these new waters. So I thought I'd show you a couple of the projects that we've done uh, both recently and some that we're about to launch. Uh, with these projects, we merge both the traditional media with the possibilities of the new online app world and to try and test some different business models in each one of them. Uh, we've In uh, Christmas, sorry to bring you back, although the snow on Saturday goes back into the Christmas mode, so just go there for a few more minutes and then hopefully summer will come to us and we'll forget about it. We created an advent calendar. A little, for all those people who didn't want to eat chocolate for 25 days, we thought, well, let's create this advent calendar and uh, offer a film every day uh, for the 25 days of, um, of the holiday season. So each day you would unlock one. You couldn't unlock them before. There were no secrets before Christmas. And then have a rich amount of doing it. So we launched that at Christmas uh, for a small fee. Our newest project that's coming up for a children's project, which will be reached, uh, launched fairly soon, is Ludovic. It's an application using beautiful content that was created by Ko Hodeman. It's designed to take kids on an enchanting journey through the four seasons, learning about the passage of time in simple, creative, and educational activities. Again, it's merging both the videos that they can see and some online games that they can play in their app. It's targeted to three to five-year-old children. There's no words on it. It's completely exploratory. But it's really bringing together that interactive activity with the children and um, moving, but still having the classic video uh, expression of also being able to see their film. It's just so, it's so nice to breathe life into that project. This is a project that came out a few years ago, and we all loved it. So it's just nice to see it get kind of a, a, new, a new redress to see that. Another model which I'm really excited about, frankly, as you know, the film board is really a home to a lot of fabulous animation, and the founder of that was Norman McLaren, who will be celebrating uh, a birthday, actually, next year. Uh, so we've created uh, McLaren's workshop, and this will be launched in the fall. Uh, this um, is a creative, it's really an homage to his creative genius of the founder of the NFB's animation studio. And with this app, you can discover his works. You can read some documentaries about what he's done. But you, what's new about it is you'll also be able to actually create your own animation using the techniques that Norman McLaren um, made so famous, such as um, paper cutout animation, scratching directly on film, although you'll be scratching on your iPad or on a view of the film from your iPad, as well as the synthetic sound. And there's no sound on this, so, but you can actually put your own sound to it create your images with the synthetic uh, sound app, and you'll be able to then share those uh, in your social networks and upload those films. This app will be marketed with an entry price and then the app in-app purchases for different modules. So as you get hooked on creating these films, you'll be able to have different ones. So we'll see how that uh, market plan works also. And this is just, uh, it's still in finalizing its design stage, but it's a bit of a sense of how the app will work and how you can choose your colors and music and bring those forward. And then there's PickStop. Uh, PickStop is a project that we've launched. We haven't really marketed it extensively yet, but we challenged our workshop animators. Um, some of you may know in Montreal and Toronto, we have award-winning workshops that we offer in many of the schools to teach children how to use these medium, either stop-motion animation or uh, digital storytelling in the classroom. So we challenged them to create a virtual version of this uh, workshop and PickStop was the result. Uh, it's a very simple, fun app that allows users of all ages to create their own stop motion animation and upload it. And it has tutorials inside it, short little videos that show how many frames a second you want to do, how many pictures to do, all those different elements. So little tutorials to show you exactly how to create this. Uh, it really releases the inner um, filmmaker in you, so buyer beware, it's quite addictive. Uh, we had planned to launch it only in the education market, and everyone who worked on it loved it so much that we're releasing it in the consumer market. This is a, an app that's free in Canada, but we're selling it internationally. So again, a different bi uh, business model that we're working on that we're pretty excited about. 
So we're pretty psyched about all these different options. And uh, for this one also, many people, to give you a sense of how we try and respond, as soon as this was even on the soft launch, um, someone contacted us and said, we love this app, but it's really hard to hold the iPad all the time while you're taking these pictures. So we had one of our team create, which is on YouTube. It's a stop motion using PickStop showing you how to create a tripod for your iPod to use the trip. So you can go to YouTube, actually. It's also going to be on the app soon uh, so that you can create a little cardboard tripod to stabilize your filmmaking process. So we've been having a lot of fun with these. We're very psyched about the future and, uh, and bullish about it, and we hope you are too. And so this is just a, a snapshot that, uh, of what we've been doing. We hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we're here to answer questions if you'd like, or maybe uh, as we're having uh, dessert. Thank you. Thank you.